Today's horsepower is on a roll with a stock Buick wagon, their newest project called Sucker Punch. They start with all-out chassis mods to make this thing ready for 800 turbocharged horsepower. Hey, Hulk, if you love station wagons, this one's a 1978 Buick Century, one of GM's last full-frame wagons. We're proud to say it's our newest project vehicle. Why? Well, first, we thought it'd make a perfect Mustang and Camaro killer in a plain brown wrapper. Also because, why not? As a rule, wagons are cool. Station wagons had some image issues during their peak years. In some TV commercials back then, it seemed the measure of a good wagon was how many kids it could haul. Hardly a young hot rodder's idea of a cool street machine. This 1929 Ford Model A is an early version of the station wagon. And what's not to love about those wonderful woody versions? Like this piece of fine furniture on wheels from the 40s, soon to be treasured by surfers and termites. Jeep introduced America's first all-steel wagon in 1946. During the next two decades, the number of makes and models would soar. Turn a classic Bel Air into a show and shine entry, and it gets admiring stares from those who remember and those who don't. Nowadays, turn any wagon into a race car, and you get instant attention at the drag strip. What used to be a whole hum hauler is now a novel nostalgic hot rod. You know what's funny? I cannot believe I'm in a station wagon, and I actually feel cool. This 78 represents both the end of an era and the beginning of one of our wildest project car builds ever. This thing has no get up and go. No, it's, it's very sad. It's very sad. That was actually to the floor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was that? The weather's driven. Oh. The body is in great shape, but the 34-year-old suspension. Oh! There All right, goes. we're done. There it goes. It's been altered for this lowered stance, and not very well. Oh, man, that was a hard one. <laughs> the guy who owned the car before obviously had too wide of a rear tire on. This is where the tire caught the lip right here, and it rolled it out. Hopefully, we'll get it back with air still in the tire. Man, we're about to limp her home. <laughs> or you could just finish it off. Clearance did! Man, we're good now. <laughs> mm -hmm, both sides now. <laughs> Oh, oh, I saw a joke fly. <laughs> but don't feel sorry for this wagon. We already ordered a high performance suspension package from Ride Tech. Because this 110 horsepower 231 V6 will get replaced with a stroke 461 inch Pontiac. Topped off with a Turbonetics turbocharger with mild boost, our goal is to make over 800 horsepower at the tire. The beauty of not reusing anything under here is being able to speed up the teardown process. Ever wonder how they got the ride height in this wagon? Well, here it is. The old school way, and pretty stupid. These clamps took half the purpose out of these springs. Now we know why chunks are missing out of the rear tires. Now we can unbolt the control arms and remove everything attached to the rear end, which is coming down for a replacement later on today. With it out of the way, we can finish back here, removing the control arms and shocks. There she blows. Back up front, same goes. With the wheels removed, we can get to the factory sway bar. Then using various tools of persuasion, we can free up all the linkage and remove it. Next, we separate the steering column from the steering box so it can come out from the top. We have to remove 30 years of gunk just to get a wrench on the bolts holding the lower control arms in place. Eventually, though, we can drop the shocks, use a chain around the springs to hold them in place for safety, and drop the arm and spindle together and pull out the original spring. Must have been out of the clamps, though, so the old hot wrench was used. Kind of takes the good out of the good old days. Finally, each lower control arm, spindle, and rotor can come out as one big, fat assembly, and our teardown's officially finished. Weather's driven. Oh. We're back at it. We showed you the wagon. Oh! 
how he destroyed the rear tires. Mm -hmm, both sides now. <laughs> and how it got that lowered stance. Here's the right way to lower a vehicle. This is RideTech's new coilover system for 78 through 88 GM G-Bodies. Now, if you haven't noticed, the G-Bodies are the last full-frame rear-wheel drive cars GM produced. They're readily available, cheap to buy, and you can find performance parts for them all over the place. Now, we're not going to talk about each part in the suspension system right now, but more about the terminology used with it. Some of the terms used when we talk about shocks is rebound and compression. Now compression is the amount of force it takes to close the shock or compress it. Rebound is the amount of force it takes to open the shock or bring it back to its ride height position. Now some of the other terms are single and double adjustable. This is a single adjustable so the compression is preset at the factory while we're able to control the rebound by this knob. They're usually in settings from 1 to 10, 1 being the softest, 10 being the hardest. Now a double adjustable shock works the same way but it controls both rebound and compression. One of the most overlooked yet most important components to the whole suspension system are the sway bars. If they're not made to match all the other components or the weight of the car, you're going to have a handling nightmare. Now we got everything in this system to do all the rear suspension and everything up front. Now some of you may notice, this is some pretty beefy stuff and there's good reason for that. We're going to be making over 1,100 foot-pounds of torque, so this rear end's got to handle it. Now this is a custom Dana 60 from DTS. It uses one of their rear support covers, as well as a set of 456 gears and a spool. Now the spool is going to allow both rear tires to turn at the same time and the same speed all the time. Now this thing uses Timken bearings and seals throughout, as well as a Cro Molly 1350 yoke and straps. Now to transfer the power from the spool to the tires are these massive 40 spline gun drilled alloy axles. Now they don't use a C-clip to hold them into the spool. They slide right into the spline and they get retained to the axle housing with this bracket that also doubles as the caliper bracket. Attach the rear lower strong arms, making sure the sway bar holes are closest to the axle. Check out the strength of this coilover bracket. The adjustable uppers can go on, and notice the Kevlar line himes, this will avoid any binding. Up on the frame, we can bolt up the upper coilover brackets in the existing holes. Make sure to apply a little lithium grease to all the urethane bushings. Now using the trans jack, we can raise the rear end as an assembly and make our connections. Make sure to leave all the bolts loose until all of the arms are in place. This will make lining up the control arms with the frame a lot easier. The rear coilovers use a 200 pound spring, a whole lot different from what we took out. Even though it's a pre-fit, it's important to tighten everything up. Now never use air tools or over torque any of these connections. This thing has several parts that are designed to move. Over tightening can cause premature bushing failure and severe suspension binding. To wrap it up, the rear muscle bar sway bar gets bolted to the lower control arms. Sweet. We didn't need to re-drill any holes or cut and modify any of the pieces. Keep in mind this was a custom axle housing as well. It just goes to show how good things can fit if the engineering is thought out. We'll see how the front goes together in a minute. Horsepower's back after beefing up our wagon's back end with a DTS axle assembly, spool, and set of 456 gears. We gave it coilover shocks, upper and lower control arms, and a muscle car sway bar. And not to waste any time, we're already on the case filling up the front end with suspension pieces. For control arms, we just installed more strong arm upper and lowers from Ritec. Even though we're using a coilover system, these lowers are the same ones used with the Shockwave air springs. Now our coilover springs are rated at 900 pounds and they're a single adjustable design. And that gets us to the spindles and brakes that just came in from SSBC, all made in the USA. Now these two inch drop spindles will house a pair of big bite 13 inch cross drilled and slotted rotors and a pair of three piston tri-power calipers that use these premium hawk pads. Now we had our calipers painted black for a reason, that's to go with that stealthy subdued sleeper look. Just like the rear, we can adjust the ride height of the car using the coilover, but there's a certain area the stroke of the shock needs to be in to maintain that ride performance. So instead of doing it in here, we're going to do it with this 2-inch drop spindle. Now this thing was designed for an S10, and it's been machined by SSBC to accept all the brakes. Plus, it's a lot better than melting the spring. Now, we can pack the rear bearing with grease. 
and using a supplied seal, knock it into place in the rotor. Then the rotor goes onto the spindle, followed by the front bearing, washer, and nut. Install a cotter pin and pop on the dust cover. Then we can slide those new SSVC calipers onto the rotors and add these stock type banjo fittings. We're using a three piece muscle bar sway bar made for G bodies. It's way stronger than stock, designed to work specifically with the lower strong arms, and it's a direct bolt in. Anytime you add weight to the front end of a vehicle, well, like with an engine swap in our case, it's always a good idea to take some off as well. And a good way to do that is with a rack and pinion kit, like this manual kit from TRZ Motorsports. It comes with a flaming river rack, plus all these accessories you'll need to keep it in place. Now, you'll have to do some welding. In addition to losing weight, though, you'll also get a better feel for the road and prevent bump steer. Here are the supplied brackets from the kit you'll be welding. Here's what you're going to be welding them to. The front suspension is at ride height thanks to a pair of screw jacks. We can position the rack, making sure it is as high as possible, but not to interfere with the oil pan. We're going a little higher than the top of the engine cross member. With a level on the top of the rack, make sure it's even. With the mounting plate attached to the rack, we can tack it in place. Making sure it's squared up, we can begin to cut the mounting tube for the other side. Remember this setup is foreign to this chassis, so there's no existing holes or template to work from. All right, looking good. The instructions are helpful, but common sense and lots of measuring will get you there. Once you're happy, finish it off. To attach the rack to the steering column, we need to cut some holes in the frame for the steering shaft to pass through. We're using a two inch hole saw. With that tackled, we'll have to wait till the engine is in to make sure we clear our headers. To finish it now could result in a lot of extra work then. Well, here are the finishing touches for the front of the wagon. For wheels, we wanted something cool but subdued enough for a sleeper, so we went with these Rocket Booster Hyper Shots from Rocket Racing, 18 by 9s front and back. Now, for front rubber, though, we went with the Nitto 245-4018s, but can't put them on just yet. We got more work to do out back coming up. We're back, but not done yet. Now here's the reasons we pre-fit all the rear suspension. The first one's pretty obvious to make sure everything fit. With all this extra heavy hardware, the old G-Body chassis is going to need some updates. It's kind of like trying to keep a bull in a chicken coop. We needed to see where we had clearance to do some serious torque box and frame stiffening, like right here. Where the upper control arm bolts to the frame. Now notice how thin this metal is. The first time the tires really hook, that can get ripped out. Now here on the lower arm, where it attaches to the torque box, this thing is only welded in a few spots and there's plenty of open areas. So we're going to go ahead and plate all that in and it'll be super strong as well. We're also going to run a tube from the frame rail to the frame rail right through here, which will stiffen it up. But we're also going to have a drop in it right here that'll double as our drive shaft loop. These cross braces are pretty weak too, so we'll cut these out and replace it with stronger material. Using a wheel spacer to act as a rotor, we need to throw on the rear wheels and check for clearance. With a trans track under the rear end, unbolt the rear shocks from the housing and let them hang. Now by pumping the jack, we're raising the tire into the fender well. Once we have the rear at ride height, rotate the tire and check for proper clearance all the way around. Everything looks good from the front of the wheel well all the way to right here. We've got a quarter of an inch. If we end up rubbing, a hammer will take care of it. This car has a tapered wheel well, which makes tire fitment an issue. Now we did our homework and it shows. To make room for the fab work, I'm lowering the rear end and unbolting the upper control arms from the chassis. This will let the rear end hang fairly low and out of the way. Using a piece of cardboard, I'm making a template to fit the upper control arm mount. Now once fitted, we'll mark the location of the bolt hole. Using 3 16 steel plate, trace the template onto it. Notice the two raised tabs coming off the plate now? We'll keep watching. Now John is prepping the areas to be welded, making sure they're free from any chassis coating or oil. Now back to those tabs from earlier. With a slicer wheel, I'm cutting slots in the plate so they will bend easier. With it in a vise, I'll bend the tabs, test fit it, clean up the edges, and drill one more hole for the bolt, and a few more for plug welds. Bolt the plate to the control arm mount and snug it up. Now tack the plate in place, and make sure the tabs are flush with the frame. 
The tabs are to strengthen the plate and improve its side load. The last thing to do is weld the holes in so there will be no flexing between the two. Repeat on the other side. After cleaning the lower control arm mounts and making some more templates, John is cutting some notched plates out of the same steel plate. The plate is recessed to fit into the control arm mount, giving us more areas to weld. With the plate level, I can tack it in place on the top and bottom, then weld it in. Its twin goes in next, followed by the same steps. To bridge the two, we'll make a template to cut out a piece of 3 16 plate, tack it and weld it in as well. One more piece will be used to box it all in. That'll be it. A new crossbar is next. Using inch and 5 8 120 wall tubing and our tube shark bender, we made a 45 degree bend and by flipping it over, another two. 25 degree bends on both sides. Okay, right, let's see what we've got. got. Hold this up against that yep. inner side. No, against the frame right, oh, right there. there. Okay. So we're gonna bend this and put them right there? Yep, right, right into the boxes. It looks like the radius is gonna be perfect up in that this area. That looks good, yeah. What we need to do is we're gonna do the bend before we cut. That way okay. we don't come up short. Making sure the tube is level and flat with the other bends, we'll go 37 degrees. Give it another on. test fit to make sure the angle is enough. Oh, that'll work. That's gonna be perfect. Bend the other side, cut it to length on the cold saw, and weld it in place. To finish off the bar, we'll bend the lower portion of the loop, notch the ends to fit the tube circumference, and weld it in too. The final pieces for the rear are the one and a half inch tubes used to tie the upper control arm mounts to the frame rail for added strength and to keep them in place. All that work to help us handle over a thousand foot pounds of torque. I'm really happy with all this fab work. Now once we get the drivetrain in the car, we're going to do some more bracing and tube work in the center and very front of the car. Now this not only improves the strength, but also the handling. Now for those of you that plan on getting a G body or already have one and you're going to put some big power to the rear, you guys have to do this. If you don't, you're going to be sorry. Hey, welcome to Horsepower and feast your eyes on the fastest Pontiac powered drag car on the planet. It's a 1963 Tempest with a twin turbo 482 engine and it was dynoed at 2800 horsepower. Built by Rodney Butler and Travis Quillen, it runs the quarter mile in 6.27 seconds at more than 228 miles an hour. Well, today we're going to harness some of that technology to build an engine for our station wagon sleeper project. One we started recently with this 78 Buick Century. Nice straight body, solid frame, but far from what we envision in the power department. We started this project by removing the weak factory V6, the transmission, and just about everything else underneath. We gave it a set of Rytec coilover shocks, upper and lower control arms, and muscle car sway bars front and rear. We added some reinforcement of our own. So what can we put in this thing to make it a vicious yet streetable sleeper? Well, here's the plan. We're gonna build a 461 Pontiac turbo engine with a horsepower target of 800 plus. After combing the one ads, we closed the deal on a used Pontiac 400 engine just for the block. Casting numbers confirmed it was produced in 1973. That's good. You see 400 blocks cast before 1975 have thicker walls and can handle more power. Butler Performance in a little town called Leoma, Tennessee has earned an international reputation as the go-to place for high performance Pontiac parts, rotating assemblies and engines. It was founded by Jim Butler, who shares his Pontiac passion and expertise with sons David and Rodney. People saw us race, wanted the engine work, and uh, that's how I got started. Today, their engines go in just about everything from restored show-and-go muscle cars to all-out race cars. Now, the first order of business for our 400 block is converting it from two-boat to four-boat mains. Now, that begins with changing out the dowel pins then drilling and tapping for the additional studs. Uh, the factory cast caps, even four bolt main, you still had a weak point in the cast cap itself. So 
when we go to the billet cap, it actually makes the bottom end itself stiff. These billet caps came from Mylodon, and here's why you can't just bolt them on and go. That overlap there would never allow the crank to even spin. So after painting the block for rust protection, the next critical steps are boring and honing the main caps. This is an interference cut, which means Ronnie the machinist only cuts the cap half of the bore. It's very crucial that he only takes a little bit of material away at a time. It's a little different than some of the other blocks, especially in the thrust area. Um, you, you have to know what you're doing with that uh, area. You can uh, you cut too much, and, and once you cut the block, you know, you're done. And on the final pass, he leaves about five thousandths. Now that way, all the mains can be line honed to the exact same size. Next, the fixture and collets come out to get ready for line honing. Not before some thorough deburring, though. After reinstalling and torquing the billet caps, it's time to work on the fronts and rear, which involves cutting the sides to ensure getting a straight 90 degree war cut. Then after cutting down the mating surfaces, Ronnie's ready for the final line honing. Again, it's a little bit of honing, measuring, well there's five thousandths, and a little more honing. At three thousandths, he's almost there. Then we can go on to the usual cylinder bore and hone work. The rest of our machining is pretty routine. With the Elderbrock heads and its turbo application, there's really not a lot to do. We're going to clean the heads up, um, just clean the ports up, do a port match for the intake and the exhaust to really flow well out of the box. We're using a forged rotating kit from Eagle. The weights, of course, represent the piston and rod weight. By spinning everything up at 500 RPM, he can detect any imbalance, and the machine will tell him where to add or remove weight. In our case, a little bit's got to come out. By the way, our bottom end combination will give the turbo engine a four and a quarter stroke. With the longer stroke engine, this thing makes a lot of torque and makes it instantly. So uh, with a heavy street car, it's going to be uh, a handful on the street. Horsepower is back and so is our freshly machined Pontiac 400 block. How, you might ask, can we expect to make 800 or so horsepower starting with a foundation like this? Well, for starters, how about a Turbonetics air-to-air -air turbocharging system? Then, of course, the Edelbrock high-flowing port-matched heads, and, of course, the heart of our rotating assembly, that forged crank with a four-and-a-quarter stroke. Well, before we get down to business, Dave, what do you think of this combination? Well, I think it's going to be a lot of fun in the uh, station wagon. Um, it's going to make a lot of power. So many of our customers are doing a lot of the same thing with modern components, EFI, things like that, in their older cars. Uh, the horsepower is going to be great but the torque's going to be uh, really something to see, I think. Now, when we were at the Butler's, we actually showed you how these Mylodon steel caps are fitted, bored, and honed. Now, that's one size. Once you get ready to assemble and you put the bearings in, you need to go ahead and check again. On a high horsepower turbo application like this, if you don't, you're going to waste a lot of money. The numbers are all good, so we can remove the caps and be sure to keep them in order. Now, some silicone in these holes and on the edge of the new rear main seal from BOP. It's a big improvement over the factory rope seal, which breaks down and leaks over time. Now, a liberal coating of assembly lube on the other bearings Okay. before we drop in our Eagle crank. It came with an ESP armor finish that's designed to extend the bearing life, and it also sheds oil from the counterweights while they're spinning. The rear main cap gets an extra dab of silicone before it goes back in place. Then we can install the other main caps. Our pistons are a float and pin design, and we're installing them with a set of Total Seal stainless rings. The assembly goes into the number one cylinder so we can degree the camshaft after it's installed. Now on most street camshafts, the exhaust duration is usually equal to or greater than the intake duration at 50 thousandths. Now this camshaft's gonna be the exact opposite. We're running what they call a reverse duration split, as well as a 114 degree wide lobe separation angle. Now what that's gonna do is minimize overlap as well as intake reversion due to the back pressure on the turbo. Well, in case you don't have a degree in mechanical engineering, here's what all that meant. With the boost being shoved into the cylinder with the turbo, well, your valves have to dance a little bit differently, but you don't have to know the steps. Your machinist or manufacturer can hook you up with the right cam. 
In fact, Butler spec this comp cams grind at 252 intake, 245 exhaust at 50 thousandths. Gross valve lift is 540 and 541. Okay, now because we put new caps on this block, we actually bored it and honed it, we raised the center line of the crankshaft just a little bit. Now in order to keep our valve timing correct, we had to go with the 10,000 shorter chain to keep the stretch from putting our cam timing all over the place. Now that we've degreed the cam, we can move on to the rest of the rotating assembly, and that includes these Eagle connecting rods to match their crank. Now, piston choice is pretty critical with the turbo application. These Ross Forge pistons have extra strength here in the skirt area. A little weight taken out here. And notice how the top ring is lowered to help with heat transfer. Butler deburred all these edges to prevent detonation. And this design is all about lowering compression to 8.5 to 1 to accommodate for the boost and keep the engine pump gas friendly. Go ahead, John. This timing cover from Ames Performance goes on next to finish up the front of our block. And this little piece is to hold the end of the dipstick in place. We're using a spacer with this Pro Pump oil pump. This will help give us the correct pump to pan clearance we need. Notice anything missing, like the shaft? It goes on later. We're making sure we have at least 15 thousandths clearance between each rod end. We've got 24, so we're good to go. This one-piece reusable gasket from BOP is new to Pontiac engines. We're using it on a Mylodyne oil pan with kickouts for a seven-quart capacity. And we're a big step closer to filling our sleeper wagon with some big horse turbo power. We're back to continue filling this hole in our Buick Century sleeper wagon. So far, we've added some top chef components to our Pontiac block, okay. like a balanced forged crank, custom grind camshaft, a set of forged turbo-ready pistons and rods. Then we finished up the bottom end with a slightly shorter timing set, oil pump, and pan. So now onto the top end. And after oiling the lifter bores, we can fill them with comp retrofit hydraulic lifters. You've seen us use Edelbrock Performer heads many times before. They always work right out of the box. But Butler Performance has taken these several steps further, not only port matching, but giving them a valve job, deburring and polishing the combustion chambers. Then up on top, they gave them stiffer comp valve springs with titanium retainers. Plus, there are four oil return holes in each head. They go in and touch them up to improve the flow. Butler even designed this Cometic multi-layered steel gasket and we've added copper coat spray sealant between each layer. ARP head studs are a must in an ultra high performance application like this. And after we lower the heads into place, we can add washers and nuts, which we pre-coated with ultra torque assembly lube. Remember the missing oil pump drive? Here it is, a little longer than stock to compensate for the spacer we added earlier. The rest of our comp valve train includes these push rods and a set of 1.5 ratio ultra gold roller rocker arms. And after lashing them down, we can bolt down the valley pan. We're running an Edelbrock Torker 2 intake manifold on this engine for a couple of reasons. The first one is to give us our torque and drivability we need down low for a street engine. The second, it already has machine bosses in it for the injectors. Now with these fuel rails, it's designed to run a Pico style injector, which is a short compact unit, but we can only find it with a flow rate of up to 52 pounds an hour, and that's not gonna be enough. So we stepped up to these Trick Flow Specialties 120 pound an hour and had to raise the fuel rails. We also had to cut a section out here and add this piece the line to get a little extra clearance for the throttle linkage. Other than that, the intake's been port matched to the cylinder heads down at Butler's. We're bolting up this mechanical water pump from Mylodon next. Then the crank pulley bolts up to the harmonic balancer. All these drive pulleys, billet brackets, and even the alternator came in a March performance kit we got from O'Reilly Auto Parts. Here's another accessory we'll need with our turbo application a vacuum pump that improves ring sealing while preventing blow-by and detonation. Before we drop on the valve covers, we'll add some assembly spray that coats the rockers and push rods to protect them during initial startup. I guess we don't have to tell you who made these cool aluminum valve covers. Now that we've got the vacuum pump plumbed up and the belts installed, time to transfer the engine to a dyno car. We want to fire it up and run it naturally aspirated first, so we can seat the rings and make sure we don't have any fluid leaks. 
After bolting up a set of Hooker Super Comp headers, we can prime the oiling system and drop in an MSD Pro Billet distributor for this Pontiac application. It's definitely getting easier to do the turbo stuff. It used to be you had turbo kits for Mustangs and that was it. But now, you know, you got a turbo going in a Buick wagon with a Pontiac engine, so you can, it, you can, you can put a turbo in anything now. With timing set at 32 degrees before TDC, the engine fires up perfectly the first time. By the way, we're feeding it for now with a Holley 850 car. After the warm-up period, we're making several 6,000 RPM pulls. Man. It's making great power. Eight and a half to one motor, 461 inches, made 430 horsepower, 485 foot-pounds of torque. Instant torque, even without that the turbo. That thing is a beast. Man. <laughs> it's going to break 800 easy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you guessed it. The turbo's next. The Butler Brothers did it again, laying the foundation for our stout Pontiac small block. They even massaged its aluminum performance heads. After we topped it with a multi-port EFI intake, it made a ferocious 430 horses naturally aspirated. Now we're ready to get blown away. Mike and John spent the whole day fabbing up tubes for the turbo just for the dyno runs. The system comes from Turbonetics and includes a new gen wastegate that diverts exhaust gases from the turbine to control turbo speed. This is Turbinetic's new 76 millimeter mid-frame turbo made of forged billet with a 75 millimeter turbine at 1.14 air ratio. From it, a charge pipe connects to the Spirco air-to-air -air intercooler and another charge connects to this Godzilla bypass valve assembly. It's for surge protection to the throttle body. We chose Holly for the entire EFI system, starting with the HP EFI. Now it's fully tunable and we're running ours in a multi-port setup. We invited Robin Lawrence of Holly Performance to hang out with us while we get the system up and running. We're seeing this thing, you know, from the average, uh, you know, uh, Chevelle, that big lot that somebody wants to have fuel economy to, you know, guys with two 2500 horsepower turbocharged or procharged uh, combinations. Using their software, you can load up the engine specs like cubic inches, the rev limiter settings, and sensor information to name a few. We're removing the plugs to spin the engine to prime the turbo. It's a must before the first fire up. Failure to do this can result in bearing damage or worse. Now it's Robin's turn. Yay. With the engine up to temperature, we'll enter the fuel learn table. The yellow cursor represents the RPM the engine is running. Notice the small numbers populating and becoming more steady? This system has learning capabilities, and it's building a table based on our targeted air-fuel ratio. It's creeping. It's creeping. Right. Rock and roll. We're starting with four and a half pounds of boost and working our way up to 11. Yeah, it's happy. It's real happy. What are you seeing for power? 475, 82. It's up to you. We'll just keep creeping. We made a lot of pulls, slowly adding boost and gaining horsepower. 547, 631. We're currently up to seven pounds. 5.4, 6.3, 6 6.8, 6 7. Pipe, come on. Yep. We knew this temporary tubing could be a problem, but we learned that everything is working fine. I know we came up some because it's 602, 498. We can't help ourselves for trying for a few more pounds. At this point, we're just wasting fuel. But at only seven and a half pounds, yeah, baby, we got 652 horsepower. <laughs> the tubing for the wagon will be solid, so the chassis dyno will show the true power of Project Sucker Punch. It's horsepower's most uncanny car build ever. Buick Century G-Body wagon that was sagging when we got it. Oh! Before we beeped it up, front to rear underneath. Then we built it a 461 Pontiac Stroker engine that was screaming for a turbo charge. Yeah, baby! The question now, will it live up to its knockout name, right. Sucker Punch? Now it's come together time for the body and soul of this sleeper wagon. Engine in, 
transmission in, systems for turbocharging, cooling, fueling, everything to deliver that sucker punch power to the rear wheels. They say the devil's in the details, and we've got a few more to handle before dropping in our engine, like pressure washing the engine bay. We follow that with a coat of Dupa Colors HVT enamel. We like it because it looks good and dissipates heat. This stuff won't crack or peel even in 550 degrees of heat. The headers we use in the dyno have to go, and you'll see what replaces them later. But for now, the throttle body comes off too, so we can bolt on a lift plate. We need to lower the 461 into the engine bay to see how it's going to fit. Okay, well, back a little. No instruction manuals for this. All right. It's all seat of the pants R&D. It's about where it needs to be. Even though it replaces a small factory V6, oh, oh. there should be plenty of room in this ample yeah, G-body. Now, inches. it's important to accurately center up the engine. See, if you line it up like that, it's all, yeah, it, I mean, it's close. Straight, yeah. And with it level and braced, we'll use the factory chassis mounts. With the help from some square stock, cut to length, drill two holes, and loosely bolt it to the block. Now cut two tabs to connect the tube to the chassis. Once you're happy, weld them in and add a little paint to stop rust and bolt it in. Now that you're good at it, do the same thing on the other side. For a trans, we're repurposing the one we used in our 10th generation T-Bird build last year. Still has fluid in it. And of course, John's wearing it. Oh, that's great. It's all over my pants. Oh. Oh, I had an accident, no. coach. You got any more jeans here? No. Teacher, I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> While John takes a spin to the store, we'll move on. We're reusing this thing for good reason. TCI's 6X six-speed is the first automatic built to handle 850 horsepower. It uses the 4L80 case, but inside two more clutch packs, six in all, race-proven planetaries, and it's got billet gear stands for extra strength. TCI cut off the factory bell housing and added an adapter plate to make this trans made up to Fords, Dodges, and Chevys. This one's made with the correct bolt pattern for our GM block. The new torque converter's got a 3,000 stall speed for a turbo application, and it's drilled with a bolt pattern to match our new flex plate. There it goes. By the way, John's back, and he's wearing the tags. <laughs> <laughs> Poor girl at the checkout, you know, I said, I had an accident, I need to check these out and I'm gonna go in the bathroom and swap them out. It's all right, honey, we've all had an accident once or twice. Like, no, it's, uh, it's transmission fluid. You know what I mean? It's okay, you don't have to explain it. It's just horrible, man. Once again, moving on. With the wagon in the air, we first want to mount this plate and gasket for a remote oil filter. This TCI flex plate is SFI rated and 35 thousandths thicker than stock for higher RPM engines and high stall converters. With that, we can raise the 6X trans into place. Where are your fingers at, Mike? Oh, there we go. That's always a welcome sound. Now we can finish bolting it up. It's all lined up for a straight shot back to the drive shaft. The next job will be to build a custom cross member for the trans. We'll grind down some mounting locations on each side for a couple of plates we just fabbed up. We'll cut a smaller piece that boxes in the factory frame and gives additional support. A couple of vertical tabs go on each side for sleeves and through bolts. The next step is to notch the ends of this first piece of steel tubing we cut to length. Then line it up and tack weld it into place. Do the same to the second piece. Since this is a solid chassis mount, just like the engine, this polyurethane tranny mount will absorb any frame twist that could break the tranny case. Now the entire cross member assembly comes out for TIG welding. For added strength, we're adding a pair of gussets on each side of the center plate. Before it goes back up, we'll give it a coat of Duplicolor Prep Spray and to set it apart from the rest of the drivetrain, a coat of their aluminum engine enamel. Now all that was pretty simple and straightforward and for good reason. And we don't have any clearance issues to worry about on the exhaust back here because it's a turbo we're going to dump out right in the front of the motor. Now that is what we're going to get to next. Back on the build, we're going to get started with the turbo piping. Now each application is a little bit different, but there's one thing that stays the same. You always want to start with the hot or the exhaust side of the turbo. Now because of some room constraints, we have to run these round tube exhaust manifolds we got from Ram Air Restorations. There we go. 
They're based off of a factory Ram Air 4 manifold, but they flow up to 16% more. They're ceramic coated inside and out, which will reduce temps up to 40%, and the collector size is 2.45 inches for larger exhaust pipes. Until we get every last pipe in place, we're just in a mock-up stage. Now for the turbo, I'm using two and a half inch stainless steel pipe from Magnaflow. Now we got them in a variety of bins, and I've already run into a little bit of a challenge. The flange is cast and coated just like the manifolds. Now a lot of guys say it's hard to merge the cast with the stainless, but what I did is I cleaned all the coating off of the flange really, really well and welded the two together with stainless rod. Now the real test is going to be in the car down the road, but it looks pretty good on the outside. With a little trimming, our cast and stainless experiment can be bolted up to the manifold. Then I can route more tubing from the driver's side to the passenger side using V-band clamps to hold them in place. While my handles that, I'm going to get to work on the fuel system. Starting out back with this new custom-made tank from Rick's Hot Rod Shop. It's stainless steel with fittings for two feed lines, one return line, plus two vents. And they made it to fit in the stock location. Of course, for safety's sake, you need to replace the straps when you swap out a fuel tank. Next in. These things fatigue and wear out over time. From the tank, we're using Earl's Dash 10 hose ends with push lock fittings that are made to use with their super stock fuel lines. Now we want to mount our fuel pump as close to the tank as possible to help prevent from vapor lock. This Holly Dominator inline billet piece is actually two pumps. Now you can use it simultaneously or in stages as you add boost. It has filters that mount on each side, a 100 micron going in and a 10 micron filter going out. From there, we got lucky with an existing hole for the line to pass through. After we enlarge it and add an Earl's firewall grommet to prevent chafing. Mike's been busy too, cutting and welding the hot side to finish it under the car. This is the last piece down here, and the V-bands will allow easy removal of the entire system. And from behind, you can see just how smooth and unrestricted the exhaust merges and heads upward to the front of the engine bay. This pipe will end up going to our turbo to complete our hot side. Now this 90 degree bend can't stay here because the water hose for the radiator has to go right here. Another thing to keep in mind is how far the radiator and fans stick out towards the engine. That eats up a lot of space where you can run some of your tubing. Now up next, we're gonna mount the turbo and it's gonna go right about here. That way we can run the exhaust down in this area and the filter will be up away from all the engine heat in the fender well. First, I'll notch a piece of double D shaft we're reusing from the dyno setup. So together with the original flange, we can make a mount for the turbo. Now we can make sure it's in the spot where we want it. This flange opening is larger than our two and a half inch pipe. So I'll cut off the flared end of a three and a half inch piece, TIG on a 90 degree bend, and form it to fit the bottom side of the turbo flange. Time for the big moment. Dropping the turbo onto its new home. Oh yeah, check that out. Mm -hmm. Now this is the way a lot of racers do it, with the turbo and the engine mounted solidly to the frame. We're finishing up the hot side of our 461's turbo system, so the exhaust can pass from new manifolds through a lot of custom tube work, and finally to the Turbonetics turbo unit. Remember the bend that was here earlier? Well, I went ahead and extended the pipe out. Now we can run it underneath the balancer and make the connection up here to the turbo, and that'll complete the hot side. And after a lot of cutting and test fitting, we'll create an S with two bends. Finally, with the whole welded section installed, connect it to the turbo with another V-clamp. Onto the cool side, we'll install this Spearco intercooler that we got from Turbonetics. Now it installs with two 90 degree brackets, we'll bolt to the intercooler and the core support. We've got a new radiator custom made for G-bodies by CNR Racing, the same guys that make them for NASCAR. They hand TIG welded this thing, pressure tested it, and rated it at over 900 horsepower. It's designed to fit right in the stock location. The dual 12 inch small fans will help pull heat out of the intercooler. Anytime you install a radiator, make sure it's got movement in the core support. There. The top grommets here will allow for that. If it doesn't have any movement, the radiator can twist with the core support and break. Hayden sent us this temperature control setup, and with the thermostat in place, the adjustable unit mounts between the fans using plastic rivets. 
We'll finish off the cooling with Earl's Formaflex hoses. Now you know you're getting somewhere when you're ready for the throttle body and the hat. We're cutting pieces of reinforced two and a half inch rubber tubing for intercooler sleeves. After that, well, you guessed it, more custom tubing. From the bottom of the intercooler, all the way up to the hat. Our last piece is one you'll hear but never see, the exhaust, covered with DEI and high temp spray to protect the engine from heat. When it's time to put the power to the rear end, the only link between the transmission is the drive shaft. Now we knew we needed one that could handle some abuse, so check this out. Denny's drive shafts built us one of their three and a half inch steel nitrous ready shafts that can handle in excess of 2,000 horsepower. It uses 1350 spicer joints throughout, and unlike other shaft makers who so-called high speed balance their shafts between two and 3,000 RPM, Denny's has the capability to go to 10,000 RPM or to the RPM you specify. Now each shaft has a lifetime warranty against twisting or breakage, and if you ever need any labor done on the shaft, you pay for the parts, the labor's free. With the drive shaft secured, we can jump up front for a high torque starter from Summit Racing. To help slow the wagon down, a master cylinder from stainless with a built-in proportioning valve. To keep the sleeper theme, the Trans TCU goes under the seat, not so successful with the TCI shifter, but we redeemed ourselves with the ignition box. At this point, there's a huge list of tiny things to do. So we're not including you in the boredom. No. After all, we know what you want to see. All right, John, I've got the throttle. See if it'll fire. OK. Yeah. No clanking, no squirting, no smoke. Best of all, I don't hear a pipe leak. These autometer gauges will tell us everything else, and we mounted them to the original bezel. And yes, the original hood will close. I'm happy about the stock look we were able to keep. All we need is a lugger drack and a small retro camper in tow. But then again, maybe not. Sorry, but we're not going full throttle yet. There's a lot of things to check out before playing at the track. But for now, our sleeper is a keeper.